You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Hi, I'm Maria Varmazas, and I'm the host of T Minus, the only daily podcast for the space industry. Every weekday, I'll be covering the latest news in space technology, business, and governance by talking with the people who are forging the path in this new space era. If you're a space professional looking to separate the signal from the noise and stay current on what's happening, this show is for you. Join me every day for T-Minus, the daily space industry podcast. Listen on all major podcast platforms or visit space.n2k.com. That's S-P-A-C-E dot N, the number two, K dot com. Our sponsor, Collide, has some big news. If you're an Okta user, they can get your entire fleet up to 100% compliance. How? If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud apps until they fix the problem. It's that simple. Without Collide, IT struggles to solve basic problems, like ensuring everyone's OS and browser are up to date. Unsecure devices log into your company's apps with no problems because there's nothing there to stop them. But Collide works seamlessly with Okta to enforce compliance as part of authentication and complete the zero-trust security puzzle. Visit collide.com slash cyberwiredaily to learn more or book a demo. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash cyberwiredaily. Black Cat follows Klopp exploiting the Go Anywhere MFA vulnerability. The Mirai botnet exploits a vulnerability disclosed at Pwn to Own. An RSAC presentation describes the U.S. response to Russian pre-war and wartime cyber operations. The U.S. Department of Homeland Security outlines cyber priorities. Andrea Little Limbago from Interos shares insights from her RSA panels. The U.S. indicts and sanctions DPRK operators in a crypto laundering campaign. My guest is Mark Van Zadelhoff, CEO of Devo, with insights from the conference and the latest on KillNet. From the RSA conference in San Francisco, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire security briefing for Thursday, April 20th, 2023. At Bay reported this morning that Klopp is now seconded by Black Cat in using the Go Anywhere MFT exploit, CVE 2023-0669. The researchers write, The vulnerability is a good example of how cybercriminals don't just go after the most prevalent or publicly known CVE disclosures. The most important indicator of risk isn't just the score that's given to the vulnerability, but how easily it can be exploited by cybercriminals in the wild at scale to achieve a desired outcome. Forda released a patch to remedy this vulnerability in February of this year, and all users are recommended to install the patch. As well, At Bay urges organizations using the affected Go Anywhere MFT versions to immediately follow the mitigation methods recommended by Forta. Black Cat seems increasingly active, as At Bay reports. According to At Bay's claims data, which includes any confirmed attacks against its 30,000-plus policyholders, the Black Cat group was responsible for 9.8% of ransomware claims in 2022, making it the third most successful ransomware group last year. This year is trending similarly with 13.5% of ransomware claims in the first three months of 2023 coming from Black Cat. Despite being a relative newcomer, Black Cat is also the third most active ransomware group so far this year, following Royal and Lockbit. The Zero Day Initiative announced discovery of new activity using a Zero Day exploit that surfaced during last month's Pwn to Own event. The report says... 
This bug in the TP-Link Archer AX21 Wi-Fi router was originally disclosed to ZDI during the Pwn to Own Toronto event, where it was used by Team Vital in their landside entry against the TP-Link devices and by Curious Security in their WAN side entry. The report continues, TP-Link released a firmware update in March that fixed some security issues, including this and other CVEs. It was after this fix was made public that exploit attempts using this CVE were detected in the wild. The Zero Day is now being used by the Mirai botnet. The Zero Day initiative began seeing the exploit in the wild on April 11th. Mirai botnet was using the exploit to make an HTTP request to the Mirai C2 servers to download and execute a series of binary payloads. Seeing this CVE being exploited so quickly after the patch being released is a clear demonstration of the decreasing time-to-exploit speed that we continue to see across the industry. The researchers recommend that users apply TP-Link's patch, which is the only effective defense against the exploit. A joint presentation by CISA and Cyber Command's Cyber National Mission Force described interagency, international, and public-private cooperation as vital to the blunting of Russian cyber operations. The case study they presented at RSAC yesterday focused on the response to the SVR's Solarigate intrusion into SolarWinds and the threat that posed to government networks. That incident occurred in 2021 and so predates Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but it arguably represented battle space preparation. And in any case, the Allied response has continued to blunt the effectiveness of Russian cyber operations in the present war as well. The Washington Post summarizes some of the presentation's lessons and also describes the ways in which a deeply compromised Russian intelligence establishment has been unable to operate effectively against Western targets. Apply the usual cautions with respect to overconfidence. As Captain Solo once said, don't get cocky, kids. The Department of Homeland Security is assessing its cyber priorities in the department's recently released Quadrennial Homeland Security Review. NextGov reports that the review warns of more complex threats that may target many industries and sectors. The review emphasizes deterrence of cyber attacks against critical infrastructure and does so in the context of public-private collaboration and the development of a pool of highly skilled cyber workers. The review discusses mitigation of active cyber threats with focus on the work of the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. The review also outlines steps that governmental agencies have taken to strengthen the nation's cyber resilience. The review also highlighted ongoing international collaboration to secure critical infrastructure and fight adversarial cyber attacks. The U.S. Justice Department has announced the indictment of Sim Hyun Sop, a representative of North Korea's foreign trade bank, on two conspiracy counts. Mr. Sim allegedly conspired to launder cryptocurrency as part of an effort to evade sanctions on Pyongyang. The sanctions in question are intended to impede the development of North Korea's ballistic missiles, weapons production, and research and development programs. In a separate but related action, the U.S. Department of the Treasury has sanctioned Mr. Sim and the two over-the-counter currency traders he worked with for their illegal support of North Korea's weapons programs. Under Secretary of the Treasury for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Brian Nelson said, the DPRK's use of illicit facilitation networks to access the international financial system and generate revenue using virtual currency for the regime's unlawful weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missile programs directly threatens international security. The United States and our partners are committed to safeguarding the international financial system and preventing its use in the DPRK's destabilizing activities, especially in light of the DPRK's three launches of intercontinental ballistic missiles this year alone. Treasury emphasizes that it acted in close cooperation with South Korean authorities. And finally, to return to Russia's war against Ukraine and the rest of the civilized world, what are the cyber auxiliaries of Kilnet up to lately? In addition to creating its own virtual community college, Kilnet has been advertising various malign tools. Specifically, the hacktivist auxiliary announced on the 16th of April 
that it had partnered with operators of Titan Steeler, an accomplice in the nuisance attack against NATO school Oberammergau. Titan Steeler is billed as a universal instrument for those who possess professional knowledge in their field as well as amateurs. Uptix reported in January that the Steeler is capable of stealing a variety of information from infected Windows machines, including credential data from browsers and crypto wallets, FTP client details, screenshots, system information, and grabbed files. Killnet has also announced on Anonymous Russia's Telegram page that they're creating a new DDoS service called TeslaBot. TeslaBot is a distributed denial-of-service toolkit offered in three different flavors and prices. For $25, you get Basic, which includes 10 bots. Pro, at $75, comes with 30 bots. And the pricier Rare offers 50 bots. TeslaBot is presently in pre-sale and will be available for general purpose on April 28th. Get the bots while they're hot, we guess, or not. Coming up after the break, Andrea Little Limbago from Interos shares insights from her RSAC 2023 panels. My guest is Mark Van Zadelhoff, CEO of Devo, with insights from the show. Stick around. CISOs everywhere invest huge amounts of time and money to defend against external threats and protect sensitive data stored inside their organizations. But how do they protect sensitive data that's constantly being shared outside with others? The answer is data-centric security from Virtru. It's affordable, simple to deploy, and integrates elegantly with the collaboration apps you use every day, like Google Workspace and Microsoft 365. Trusted by more than 8,000 organizations, you can try Virtru for free. Just visit virtru.com slash cyberwire. That's V-I-R-T-R-U dot com slash cyberwire. Never refactor your apps again. Never get locked into an IDP. Say goodbye to your old on-prem systems and identity-managed complexity. Now you can solve your biggest IAM problems with identity orchestration, even the messy ones you thought were unsolvable. Bring Strata any IAM use case, like modernizing legacy apps to use passwordless authentication, migrating from one IDP to another, or enabling identity operation resiliency. Strata's identity orchestration platform is designed to extend the value of your identity infrastructure, no matter the complexity or scale. What's more? Strata's software is lightweight and flexible, developer-friendly, and vendor-agnostic. Want to see it in action? Share your identity challenge with Strata on a discovery call, and they'll hook you up with a complimentary pair of AirPods Pro. Don't miss out. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire. That's strata.io slash cyberwire. Mark Van Zadelhoff is CEO of Devo, and he stopped by for a conversation on insights from the conference, what he's looking forward to, and where he thinks we're going. Here's Mark Van Zadelhoff. So here we are. We find ourselves at the RSA conference 2023, back again. Amazing. Yeah. And I'm really interested in your insights as we come into this year's show where do you think we find ourselves as an industry? What, what's the lay of the land as you describe it at this point in time? Well, geez, I, I've been coming here since 2008, uh, probably not every year, but most of them. And in a way, maybe I'm a little cynical in that I think a lot of things have changed and then a lot of things are the same. You know, I no longer get enthralled by, oh, there was another hack or, uh, or a security company missed their earnings report. Someone just mentioned that, uh, Tenable announced their earnings and stock went down or whatever. So some of the stuff, yeah, that has ha- been happening forever. Uh, but it's happening 
on different surfaces. You know, when I first got here, I was shipping CD-ROMs with uh, C++ code. Right. Uh, years later, appliances with, uh, with Java code, and now we're in the cloud. And so I think attacks are following that same pattern, right? Uh, I'm serving as a service, and attacks are happening as a service. Attacks are happening from the cloud to the cloud, leveraging AI. So I think it's more similar themes, but on different surfaces as the world is modernized. Do you think as an industry, we've been on a path of, of increased professionalization over the past decade or so? I think so. I mean, I definitely think that when I first started coming here, the CISO was a pretty much an ornery person stuck in the basement of the building, dreaming of having some time with the board of directors. And now, you know, we, I'm not a CISO, but we as an industry, we're in front of the board. We have our moment. We have headlines and attention and... Um, and slots at board meetings. And uh, I sometimes wonder, are we doing the right things with them? We also have public attention from governments, right? So I would say our moment has arrived versus 2008 when I started uh, in this business. You know, we would say lots of things and it felt like you were yelling into the wind. Mm -hmm. As the CEO of a company, uh, what is the value proposition for you to be at a show like this? How do you choose how you're going to divvy up your time? I think as a CEO... You try and leverage the title insofar as it's worth something to give your company exposure. So I just did a nice panel at a, one of the banking conferences where I think, you know, that just gives us good good visibility to an audience that's important to us that I don't spend a lot of time on because I'm not public. Mm -hmm. uh, the banking community is an important one to kind of start to warm up. Um, and then I spend a lot of time with customers and partners and uh, ideally towards the end of the evening uh, with my team members in a bar having a beer. <laughs> Fair enough. There's nothing like being face-to-face, -face, right? Exactly. Well, you said it in this current climate, uh, you know, that's a luxury that we cannot take for granted is actually seeing each other. Do you sense that there are any specific themes this year? Yeah, I think um, certainly... AI is obviously chat GPT and AI is a, is a big theme. Yeah. And um, I think one that you're going to see on the show floor is leveraging that in product announcements. You know, we now, uh, in fact, my, my friend Christopher Alberg at Recorded Future did a really nice announcement uh, pre the show on how they're leveraging chat GPT like technology. I don't know exactly what it's using to, uh, to uh, offer a very neat experience within their, their suite of solutions. So I think you'll see more of that happening here. And what I also find interesting is discussion yesterday in a couple of meetings I was in on how do we secure AI? Mm -hmm. How do we make sure that corpus of data doesn't get hacked and abused? Because, you know, if you can hack and abuse someone's corpus of data that's being leveraged to make these decisions that we just take for granted, ask a computer a question, now you get a brilliant answer. But what if that's polluted data? Right. What if that data is designed to make you think there isn't an attack coming from a certain set of IP addresses and you base your decision on that? Check. And suddenly you realize that corpus was polluted. So yeah. this discussion of, of how do you secure AI as well. I was chatting with uh, our uh, chief security officer, Rick Howard, earlier. And we, were, and we were talking about the possibility of chat GPT being a hot topic here. And we were wondering, you know, are, are there going to be companies who say, we're now chat GPT enabled. And then the other ones who say, we protect you from things that are chat GPT enabled, right? Yeah, yeah. It's rare you see something that has that spectrum of... Uh, thought about it. Yeah, you know? but, but in a way, it, and it's different, but back to my opening answer to your question, it's just another surface, right? So, yeah. you know, we used to have the same conversations when mobile devices are uh, were introduced, right? Can we enhance security with mobile devices, an app that allows you to access data and information about your environment, or will the mobile devices get hacked, right? Will the cloud make you more secure, or will the cloud get hacked, right? So it's just a different, it's just a different, surface and, and and this AI generation will just be another surface of leverage and attack. I think that's a really powerful insight. Um, before I let you go, I would be remiss if I did not mention your podcast, which is Cyber CEOs Decoded. Uh, rumor has it that you are gearing up for your second season there. Uh, any anything we can look forward to? Any any previews for us? Well, it was a rough negotiation, but we <laughs> signed up for a second season, and okay. I'm super delighted. Yeah, we've had so much fun on that podcast, and I want to thank the CyberWire for your support. Um, you know, the whole premise of that is that being a CEO, they say, is a lonely job, and I would say at times that's for sure true. So why not get some pals on a on a podcast and demystify and decode what it's like to be a CEO? So I've had a really Fun opportunities. I think we did eight episodes with a myriad of different CEOs talking about 
pivotal points in their company's uh, development and decisions they made, and I learned from it, and I think the audience hopefully took a bunch of things away too. So yeah, season two, and uh, I uh, was able to secure at RSA the first two speakers already. So uh, oh, good. <laughs> been a good use of my time. The thing I particularly enjoy about your show is how intimate it is, that the, these are trusted relationships that you have with the people you're talking with. So I think as a listener, the value we get out of it is that um, I think your guests are much more open and candid than they might be with someone they're a stranger with. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, it's designed to be a bit of a confessional uh, setting, and uh, uh, but but safe in terms of, uh, you know, CEOs can't talk about everything, but I think we should talk about more than we think we can. And so I try and set the uh, the tone so that we try and open up about things that really are, are difficult, because if we're not talking about that, then we're not going to solve them. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today and uh, hope you have a good rest of the week. Awesome to see you. Our thanks to Mark Van Zettelhoff from Devo for joining us. And it is always a pleasure to welcome back to the show Andrea Little Limbago. She is a senior vice president in charge of research at Interos. Andrea, it's great to see you. Great to see you again. Love being in person. I know it's so uh, it's such a treat, isn't it? It is a, treat. <laughs> it is a very like, all too rare treat. Yes, uh, yes. I think we appreciate it much more than we did in years past. Absolutely. Um, so you are quite busy here at the RSA conference uh, this year. You, there's a couple of well, you just wrapped up a panel as we record this. Uh, and you have another one later in the week. Let's go through those. What what are the conversations that you're part of? Yeah, no, thanks. And there's even one different one yesterday, a, a pre-RSA event, because that's you know, to really optimize the entire week. You, right. So I can kind of tie all of those <laughs> okay. in, in, in together. Okay. Um, what we just discussed uh, a couple minutes ago was with Edna Conway and Aaron Joe from Andy. And so oh, yeah. brought together you know, luminaries in the industry sure. to talk about what this new normal is and how to prepare for operational resilience and the new normal. Okay. And so setting the stage, uh, you know, I have a political science, international relations background. So I always look at things as far as international systems and how they're shifting. And I look at 2020 as a really big inflection point where the world before and the world after are very, very different. Okay. There are some trends that, you know, got us to that point that still continue and persist, but they're really accelerated. And, and 2020 is the marker because of COVID or? Uh, you know, it, the pandemic really shook things and then accelerated some of the other trends. And so, okay. so for example, uh, on geopolitics and trade sanctions, those had started prior to COVID. Mm-hmm. From 2020 on, not directly linked to COVID, but some some you know, tangential uh, components, we also saw exacerbation of geopolitical tensions, of geoeconomic statecraft. COVID really drove home the supply chain risk. Mm. And so while that was more in the you know, PPE, if we remember that, and some of the different concentrations risks, Supply chain really started to elevate across the board and into cybersecurity as well. Because when we had Silver Winds, we right. had the Log 4J, we just keep seeing the steady drumbeat of what used to be considered Black Swan events occurring much more naturally or much more frequently. And so we kind of set the stage for what that new normal is and you know, tying on top of that you know, climate change as well, mm-hmm. which does have a cybersecurity risk component to it, especially if you think about data centers. Mm-hmm. Um, really bringing in all these range of disruptions that are going on that are going to be part of this new normal on top of the, the transformation that's underway for globalization. And that's the geopolitical aspect of it, where we are seeing the segmentation of the globe into different kinds of trade flows, um, technology spheres, all of that is, we're still very nascent in it, but that's really where we're seeing that all of that accelerating, kicking off really in 2020. And so how do you, as an organization, prepare operational resilience in this world where we're seeing supply chain shift, where we're seeing technologies that perhaps were you know, embedded in your supply chain stack that you now have to remove due to sanctions. Hmm. How do you deal with concentration risks in potentially adversarial countries? Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, the whole range of supply chain attacks themselves, which have increased you know, 600% over the last year. Uh, we keep seeing more and more reports coming out of you know, the newest supply chain attack. It's really an you know, increasingly common attack vector uh, replacing malware and data compromise over the last year. And so how do you build operational resilience? And that, you know, given that you know, somewhat bleak overview of this world that we're, <laughs> what, that we're what entering. What did this panel conclude? <laughs> were, were there conclusions made? Uh, there were. And on the one hand, you know, it, you know, we don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about it and ignore these disruptions that are going on. Hmm. But we can build operational resilience by understanding that these shifts are underway 
And one of the key things that was focused on was uh, looking at it as a, as a we problem, not as a me problem. And so looking at how can companies both work in, you know, internally, transform how they're organize, organized to make sure there's the proper information sharing going on, and then how can they then work with their supply chains, with the government, with all of their, the extended partner ecosystem to together you know, raise all boats uh, mm-hmm. to help build operational resilience. And so that was, honestly, I think one of the, the highest takeaways because I think we still look at it from our own silo perspective. And yeah. we do need to you know, branch out and think about how can we work together in innovative ways to prepare for this because the adversaries are. And that was a point Aaron Joe made. You know, she works in Mandiant, bought by Google. Just how much adversaries are working together, um, the APT groups mm-hmm. working together, that on the defensive side, we need to be doing the same thing, working together as much, if not more. Um, and so we talked about that a bit, talked about really shifting our, frame, our mindset and our framework for how we think about information sharing. And that goes on both sides for... In the private sector often views, well, we sure got information with the government and we don't know what happens with it. It's a one-way street. Right. So making sure that's more of a mutual benefit for everyone. And then on the government side, really trying to help incentivize private sector to come forth with the information that they may uniquely have that no one else has. Is there any sense for who is best positioned to lead this charge? Is this, we have the ISACs, we have you know, the federal government could do something. Was there any discussion there? Uh, that's a challenge. Right? Yeah. So there's, you know, yeah. it's almost, in some regards, you know, the government can help set the stage, but the government isn't going to be the one you know, determining how you know, private sector works across their supply chain, for instance, and getting some of that information. They can help provide some frameworks for it, and that's, I, I think, exactly where um, they can do what's best. But one of the core components was really building trust. And I think what an interesting component was uh, that we ended on was you run an RSA, so there's you know, RSA buzzword bingo and zero trust. Right. Is certainly at the top of all of them. Sure. So how do you build trust that is needed for collective resilience and collaboration when all we're hearing is it should be zero trust and don't trust anyone? Interesting. And so looking at that, you know, what might seem like a, you know, orthogonal to one another, thinking about zero trust as a technological framework and how to leverage technologies to overview access controls and so forth and it's a technology solution, whereas trust is the human element of it. Mm-hmm. And so building that trust amongst humans that often gets forgotten, we've, we've talked about that on the show, Yeah. Uh, really looking at how can you can build more trusting relations across your supply chain, across private sector, public sector, especially in an era when that trust is going to be essential to help raise all, you know, all boats for higher security. Well, in the time we have left here, uh, can you give us a preview of uh, what you've got going on later in the week? Sure. And then, uh, you know, a fairly big switch on, uh, on topics, looking at with the liability and who might be accountable for breach liability going forward. And hmm. um, so looking at, you know, where does the buck stop? Who's accountable for breaches? Is it the CISO? Is it the CEO? Is it the board? And, you know, this sort of stemmed from, uh, we saw CISO go to jail for, different aspects of, of data breaching. It's not necessarily as straightforward. Um, it was more so the handling of the, of the data breach. We saw that you know, several right. months ago. Right. And that really sent a chill throughout the, the CISO community for what needs to be done to not have that happen. How, are there steps that CISOs can take to make sure that they can protect themselves? But then also, where is the law going? And so we've got a panel of uh, legal experts and CISOs together to kind of provide perspective on what can be done to protect yourself to make sure you're not in that situation? But then also, where is the law going? And where is it going to be focusing on when a data breach happens? Who's going to be held accountable? Are we going to see more of that? Or is it one of those things that was, you know, are we going to see just a couple of cases here and there trying to make an example? Um, and so really talking about where the broader trend is because it was a hot topic you know, a few months ago. Haven't heard a lot about it going forward, but for organizations, they're very much so thinking about that. That hasn't, it was still very much top of mind mm-hmm. to make sure the processes are in place so that they can identify the steps they took for data breach accountability. And it's, it's hard. You know, there, there are 54 data breach uh, laws in the United States alone. Mm. So it's not an easy task to right. expect everyone. And you know, obviously, you know, of course, they vary. You know, there's not going to be sure. um, consistency <laughs> across it. Some have very short timelines. Some have 72 hours. Some have less hours. So, you know, yeah. what, you have to, what you have to provide is, uh, is different from... You know, state to state. So it's a really hard challenge and there isn't a you know, definitive answer yet, but we'll be discussing the trends that are going on, why this is a growing concern, and then 
what the security community can do to help safeguard themselves uh, as this legislation starts to shift. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to come by and visit us and share your expertise. Andrea Little Limbago, always a pleasure. Oh, thank you, Dave. And now, a word from our sponsor, Halcyon. Ransomware is still one of the largest threats facing businesses in 2023. The Halcyon platform was built to stop it through a multi-layered protection approach featuring full encryption key capture, automated decryption, and the ability to prevent other security tools on the endpoint from being unhooked. Learn more about how they're leveraging capsule network-based machine learning to reduce ransomware recovery times down to minutes by visiting halcyon.ai. And that's The Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. We'd love to know what you think of our podcast. You can email us at cyberwire at n2k.com. Your feedback helps us ensure we're delivering the information and insights that help keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. We are privileged that N2K and podcasts like The Cyberwire are part of the daily intelligence routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, as well as the critical security teams supporting the Fortune 500 and many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Irvin and senior producer Jennifer Iben. Our mixer is Trey Hester with original music by Elliot Peltzman. The show was written by John Petrick. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now, a word from our sponsor, Mimecast. You're wondering if you need more email and collaboration security. Because, as it turns out, just protecting your workspace with M365 isn't good enough. You just watched your entire company grind to a screeching halt, all because someone opened a phishing email. Next time, don't rely on one-size-fits-all security. Protect your inbox with Mimecast and diversify your security stack. For a free trial, go to Mimecast.com and keep your business from, you know, falling apart. On a final note, our friends at N2K just launched T-, the only daily space podcast. Here's what you can expect from the show. Stay tuned for T-, ready to launch. We are in a new space era. Advances in engineering and manufacturing have given us access to the heavens in ways that seemed almost unthinkable not that long ago. Private and public sector cooperation in the space industry is leading to innovation that sometimes feels like it's right out of a page of science fiction. But these achievements in space are real, And they're bringing incredible advances in defense, communications, infrastructure, engineering, and science to all of us right here on Earth. And they're happening fast. Join me. I'm Maria Varmazas, and I'm the host of T-Minus, the daily space podcast for the space industry. Every day, you'll get the news and analysis you need to stay current on what's happening in space technology, business, and governance. To do that... I'll be talking with the people who are forging the path in this new space era, from industry leaders, technology experts and pioneers, to educators, policymakers, research organizations, and more. If you're a space professional looking to separate the signal from the noise and stay current on what's happening, this show is for you. 
Join me every day for T-Minus, the daily space industry podcast. T-Minus. Available on all major podcast platforms.